Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the SEC Historical Society's program on the evolution of the materiality standard. I'm Susan Markle, chairman of the society and partner managing director at the international consulting firm, Alex Partners. I'm proud to have been a supporter, sponsor, and follower of the Historical Society since leaving the SEC after my 15-year tenure in the Division of Enforcement, including serving as the Chief Accountant of the Enforcement Division. The topic of today's program is extremely important to the rules written and actions taken by the SEC in Enforcement and the other divisions and offices of the Commission. Our panel today is comprised of experts in this area, and I'm sure it will be worth the time spent listening to their remarks. Programs such as these are not possible without support of our sponsors, and I want to thank Deloitte for sponsoring today's program. Since society's inception 25 years ago, Deloitte has been a generous and loyal annual donor, and they are the primary sponsor for the Gallery on Corporate Disclosure. Today's program is being recorded and will be part of that gallery. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Dave Lynn. Dave is a partner in Goodwin's Capital Markets Group, and chair of the firm's public company advisory practice. He previously served as the SEC's chief counsel of the division of Corp Fin, and he is a leading authority on SEC issues and is widely known for his role as senior editor of the corporatecouncil.net. Dave, take it away. Thank you so much, Susan, uh, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today uh, to address the evolution of the concept of materiality in the context of the overall history of the regulation of corporate disclosure in the United States. As, as Susan mentioned, um, I, for the last few years, I've been uh, working on curating a gallery on the regulation of corporate disclosure and the role that the SEC and the Division of Corporation Finance and, and other divisions have played uh, in the uh, corporate disclosure that companies make in SEC filings and otherwise. And so this topic of materiality is really an important one to that overall story and that overall history. And I'm really incredibly fortunate to be joined by such a distinguished panel for this program. I'm joined by uh, Trevor Bart, professional practice director at Deloitte. Uh, as Susan mentioned, this program is made possible with the generous support of Deloitte uh, and I'd really like to thank Trevor and Deloitte for their support of this program, the uh, Regulation of Corporate Disclosure Gallery, and the society as a whole. Uh, Meredith Cross joins us, and she's a partner at Wilmer Hale and served in a number of roles in the Division of Corporation Finance at the SEC, including as Director of the Division, Deputy Director, Associate Director of an International and Small Business and Chief Counsel. Uh, and uh, Meredith currently serves as president of the SEC Historical Society and is a member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, Dan Gelzer is a retired partner of Baker McKenzie. Dan served in a number of roles at the SEC, including as the SEC's general counsel. Uh, Dan was appointed by the commission as a founding member of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board uh, back in October of 2002, and again was report, reappointed in 2007. He also served as acting chairman of the PCOB for several years, and Dan was a member of the founding board of trustees of the society and later served as the society's president and chairman of the board of trustees. Uh, Rich Levine is of counsel at Whistleblower Advocates PLLC, and he is formerly a partner at uh, Labaton Suchero, and Rich has served in a number of roles at the SEC. Most recently, uh, he previously served as Associate General Counsel for Legal Policy at the SEC's Office of General Counsel. And Joan McCallan joins us, and she's up counsel at Jones Day. Uh, prior to her time in private practice, Joan served as Chief Counsel of the SEC's Division of Enforcement. Uh, Joan also served as the Society's President and Chairman of the Board of Trustees. Thank you all for all of your contributions to the fields of securities laws and accounting and auditing and for taking time to discuss this topic of materiality with me today. In terms of uh, materiality, I think just to set the stage for the things we're going to talk about, if there's one thing that I think securities lawyers and accountants can agree on, it's probably how important the concept of materiality is to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as practitioners, we have to really live and breathe the concept of materiality. Um, but I fear sometimes we might lose sight of you know, where this critically important concept came from and, 
how it's been applied over the years in the course of making decisions about financial and other disclosures that are made to investors. Uh, it, it's really an important concept in the regulation of corporate disclosure because in many ways it serves as the lens through which investors view the information about public companies and, and issuers that are conducting securities offerings. Um, you know, we, we don't have a system here in the United States where companies just sort of do a data dump of, um, of information and, uh, and then rely on investors to sort out that information. We have a system where we are carefully curating the information that investors have access to. Uh, and that's a way of avoiding the problem of having investors be subject to information overload, essentially. And from the public company's perspective and from a, the uh, perspective of issuers and securities offerings, the concept of materiality is really important because it reduces the burdens on them in terms of the information that they have to compile, develop, and disclose to investors. And they're in a position as a result of applying, uh, as looking through things that the, through the lens of materiality, where they can provide the most important information that investors need for their investment decisions. And it's done in a way that's structured and predictable and, and, um, and isn't sort of variable by issuer, issuer by issuer. But I do want to note that it's not all a rosy world in the realm of materiality. It is a complicated relationship that we have with materiality. Um, it, we grapple with it. I think on a day-to-day -day basis because the standards by which we determine whether something is or is not material or amorphous standards, and we're going to explore the evolution and the development of those standards in um, over the course of the SEC's history, uh, we, I think, often are confronted with the concept that materiality sometimes is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, there are often disagree disagreements that emerge between companies and issuers, uh, their outside counsel, their auditors, uh, and then ultimately investors who turn into plaintiffs uh, about materiality judgments, um, and, uh, and, and indeed the SEC as well in that regard. And I think one common refrain that you will hear whenever materiality judgments are discussed is that materiality is often judged with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, that particularly when we're talking about uh, enforcement actions by the SEC or um, uh, private litigation by private plaintiffs, uh, there's uh, the notion that when looking at the materiality judgments that were made and what was or was not disclosed, uh, one often has the benefit of knowing what happened uh, that you don't know without a crystal ball when you're making those materiality judgments live. And last, but I think certainly not least, and perhaps the uh, core of our discussion in this program is that materiality is an inev inevitably an evolving concept that a reasonable investor, what a reasonable investor is and what a reasonable investor would find important to an investment or a voting decision is going to change through time. And what the SEC may have thought was material when it adopted a disclosure requirement 40 or 50 years ago um, may not necessarily be material to reasonable investors today. Uh, and then at the other end of that spectrum, things that have not historically been disclosed uh, by public companies may be viewed as material today in light of uh, events that have occurred or evolving standards of materiality and the concepts that um, the reasonable investor might find uh, important to their investor uh, investment or voting decisions uh, in an um, economy and a market that we live in today. And lastly, I would just note, you know, that our focus here as well is on the SEC's role uh, in the evolution of materiality. Uh, that will be the focus of a lot of our discussion today. Uh, and, and it's so integral to the regulatory approach that the SEC takes. Um, it's very much implicated in the 
disclosure rules that the SEC considers and promulgates. It's very integral to the day-to-day -day review of public company filings that the Division of Corporation undertakes. And it's also critically important in the enforcement of the um, federal securities laws that is the province of the SEC's Division of Enforcement. And I think without the SEC's involvement in, uh, in those realms, our concept of what is and is not material would be perhaps much more challenging because the, the uh, standards are so sort of inchoate in many ways, because I think, as we'll discuss, the SEC has spent a considerable amount of time considering the question of what type of information should be disclosed to investors and how should investors receive that information um, and, you know, what what is the uh, type of information that's going to make a difference to uh, a reasonable investor that the, the courts have construed. And as a practical matter, uh, many of the things that the SEC does from a, both a regulatory and enforcement perspective you know, continues to influence our concept of materiality and the evolution of that concept and ultimately the day-to-day -day judgments that we make. Um, I think the interesting aspect of this that we'll also explore is that in many ways the SEC was on the sidelines uh, and really left the definition of the standards for materiality uh, to the courts and the courts you know have developed what is what we consider today to be very much an objective uh, but very much sometimes an amorphous standard um, that really doesn't differentiate between sophisticated investors versus not sophisticated investors um, and relies heavily on this notion of uh, what a reasonable investor would consider important. And another notable fact about the development of that case law has been the fact that courts have regularly eschewed the notion that there should be any kind of bright line standards that, that the um, concepts of materiality should not really be in black and white, but instead there's a very fact-intensive uh, analysis required whenever uh, assessing the materiality of information. And it's a, a mixed question of law and fact when litigated in the courts. And so, um, uh, so you know, despite efforts over the years and, and calls for, for much more clarity around you know, where the bounds of materiality may lie, you know, we continue to live in a world where that uh, we don't have those black and white bright line standards. And against this backdrop, I think the SEC and the SEC staff have from time to time weighed in uh, with their own guidance and their own notions of how to apply the court standards. Uh, and we're gonna discuss in a lot more detail how that has um, factored into the types of judgments that we make on materiality every day. So with that, I think perhaps the, the best place to start is our uh, the statutes themselves and, and sort of how this concept of materiality is um, both expressed and implied in the federal securities laws. And for that, Rich, maybe you could start us off with some insights on where do we look for this concept of materiality in the law itself? Okay, well, thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I, uh, I didn't start at the SEC until 1984, uh, when the commission was already 50 years old. Um, but, uh, you know, I have, I've thought about some of these early developments, and, and I think it is important to understand the history because we see similar issues coming up again and again. Um, so, you know, to, to, some, to, to uh, echo some of the themes that you, you mentioned about the importance for disclosure, um, but also for enforcement, you, know, you can see this, I think, if we start uh, at the beginning with the original 33 and 34 acts. Uh, because it's really interesting to focus on exactly where the statutes 
use the concept of materiality and kind of how they use it and what it's you know what it's there for. Um, you know, as you say, we often talk about materiality as kind of a, a core concept foundation for the disclosure regime. Um, but in the original uh, securities laws, 33 and 34 acts, that materiality is is rarely used with respect to disclosure requirements. Um, more often, uh, the, the actual references to materiality or material facts are in the parts of the statute that deal with liability, people being uh, responsible for fraud or misstatements or omissions. Um, kind of the same type of language appears in the private liability sections, section 1112 of 33 Act. Um, in section 17A, the general anti-fraud provision that's enforceable by the SEC. Um, the criminal provision, uh, section 24, they all use basically this same phrasing about um, untrue statements of material fact or omissions to state a material fact necessary to make other statements made not misleading. Um, and that language gets picked up in a couple of places in the 34 Act also. Um, and and this, this makes sense because it's essentially tracking the common law view of the cause of action for broader misstatement. Uh, you can only have such an action if it's a misstatement of a material fact. Um, now, interestingly, in you know, in the original 33 Act, the enumerated disclosures are included in Schedule A, and you know, there's there's a long list of required items, and materiality is hardly mentioned there at all. There are a couple of references to material contracts or patents. Um, but the acts also give the commission authority to write rules requiring additional disclosures. Um, and, and here too, it's not described in terms of materiality. Typically, the, uh, the statutes that give the commission rulemaking authority say something like uh, the commission may require such other information as is necessary or appropriate in the public interest. Or for, the, or for the protection of investors. Um, you know, they don't specify materiality as the standard. Um, over time, building on the statutory requirements, the commission has adopted a, many rules and forms where they specify particular information that has to be, uh, has to be provided uh, to investors. Um, this eventually culminates in the adoption of the integrated disclosure system um, sometimes materiality is, is uh, specifically dis discussed, uh, sometimes not. Um, but presumably, um, and, and maybe presumably isn't even strong enough, maybe I should say obviously, if the statutes and rules are requiring disclosures of certain items, then the requirements must reflect judgments that these are things that investors should be informed about. Well, why? Well, again, presumably because these are things that have some degree of relevance, of importance, of significance to investors. Um, and I'm trying to avoid saying are material to investors because we haven't even gotten yet to the definition of that term, but, but there it is. Um, you know, so in any event, I think you can see kind of the history of materiality as, as, as developing on, on two tracks. Uh, there is the rulemaking track, in addition to specific line item requirements. Uh, the commission sometimes adopted more general rules that in a different way tie materiality to issuer disclosures. So I'm thinking of rules like Rule 12B20 under the Exchange Act or Rule 408 under the Securities Act that you know, bring in for all filings and periodic reports a requirement to include such further material information as may be necessary to make required statements not misleading. 
that kind of like intertwines uh, an overall materiality idea into everything that you're required to disclose. Um, and uh, I guess another example is in the proxy area, rule, uh, what's now rule 14A9 um, is a general anti-fraud rule that um, incorporates this rubric of also misleading material facts or omissions to state a material fact necessary to make other statements not misleading. Um, the other track that's important, and I know we're, we're going to be talking about it, is the case law uh, that comes out of private actions or SEC enforcement actions involving fraud or misrepresentation claims. And again, you know, just to throw in some rulemaking, I, I have to at least mention uh, Rule 10b-5, which of course is you know, commission rule adopted in the 40s, which again incorporates those statutory phrases. It's unlawful to make any untrue statement of a material fact or to omit to state a material fact necessary to make statements made not misleading. Um, you know, Rule 10b-5 is famous for having generated so many thousands of cases that it's the subject of its own treatises, but for, for present purposes, it's, it's notable because it has increasingly been the source of the most important materiality case law, uh, including a lot of private actions and also, you know, SEC uh, insider trading cases uh, that, you know, kind of have their own context for materiality, uh, but have generated case law definitions that have broader applicability. Um, so that's kind of just some, some general background of the first several uh, decades of, uh, of the history of the development of materiality. Um, and you know, with that, I think I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who is going to talk about a particular um, disclosure issue that came up in the 70s that uh, has some resonance for us today as well. Yeah. Thanks, Rich, and good afternoon, everyone. Rich mentioned that he started at the SEC in the, in the 1980s. So I was there in the 1970s, and I think really two things happened in that decade that I think have a lot of resonance for the rest of our discussion here today of materiality. Uh, so l let me start with the Commission's questionable payments program. I mean, I think the probably the basic story is pretty well known. Um, Stan Sporkin was listening to the uh, Watergate hearings in the early 70s and it heard that some US companies had made illegal political contributions and asked himself the question, gee, I wonder how those were recorded on the books and records of the companies involved. That, that question led to a, a wide ranging series of commission investigations that uncovered the fact that many companies maintained off the books um, cash accounts and used them to make what were then called questionable payments, I guess bribes would be a more direct word, primarily to foreign government officials to further the company's business in, in some fashion. And the commission began to bring cases under <coughs> Rule 10b-5, which Rich referred to, um, based on these payments and more generally to press companies to make disclosures about them in their filings. And you know, I guess not surprisingly, the commission was met with the argument that well, gee, these aren't material. The, the amount of the payment is trivial relative, or really relative to anything, relative to the com company's total cash, relative to balance sheet items, relative to net income. And in response to that, the, the, the staff began to develop a series of arguments about why the amount of the payment wasn't the only determinant or the only issue in judging whether uh, a, a bribe or a questionable payment was material. These are all summarized in a report that the commission uh, issued to Congress in May of 1976, about four weeks before TSC was uh, decided by the Supreme Court. And it's some of the arguments laid out in there, I, you know, I, I think have resonance for SAB 99, which we'll be talking about later. But the, the things like the fact that the company was maintaining inaccurate books and records is in itself material, something investors should know about, uh, that small payments, small bribes might 
be the source of or something that a large amount of business is dependent <laughs> on. Um, there was also a theory based on the fact that the payment of bribes reflected on the quality of management, the integrity of management, and, and the, that was a, a fact that was material for 10b-5 purposes to investors, and that, that the, the need to pay bribes in order to maintain business suggested uh, business risks that investors should be aware of, specifically that the company might find its assets expropriated or it might be thrown out of a particular company if, if the payments came came to light. So again, I you know we'll talk about SAB 99 later, but to me, the questionable payments program was kind of the beginning of expanding the concept of materiality beyond simply something uh, quantitative or, or something that had, had to do with dollar magnitude of particular events or transactions. The, the other thing that happened uh, it's almost simultaneously during the 1970s is that the commission became enmeshed in a long running and complicated litigation involving whether it was obligated to adopt environmental disclosure rules. The Natural Resources Defense Council uh, filed a petition with the commission in 1971 asking it to, to broadly require all public companies to disclose the uh, impact that their activities had on the environment. The commission turned that down, but did promulgate a requirement that companies should disclose the material effects of compliance with federal, state, and local environmental regulation regulations on, on the company and the impact on capital expenditures and earnings and also a requirement that companies disclose their any proceedings against the company based on the environmental laws. That one didn't have a materiality qualifier in the requirement. Right? All proceedings had to be disclosed. Um, and without going through all the ins and outs of the litigation, the district court eventually said that viewed all that as insufficient and directed the commission to hold a proceeding in which it tried to determine the extent of investor interest environmental disclosures. The commission did in fact have 19 days of public hearings on that question and compiled a very voluminous uh, record. The, you know, the, the, the end of the story was that the commission determined that, at least from the perspective of the mid-1970s, investors weren't particularly interested in using environmental information to make investment decisions, although it might have more relevance to uh, proxy voting. And, uh, again, and maybe the, the things that are most salient to the future, it also made clear that it viewed its disclosure responsibilities as tied to the economic interests of investors. And investors might want to be interested in various kinds of information, but that the commission's jurisdiction related to information they wanted to make economically motivated investment decisions. And so that was kind of a... a, 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 a a qualification, if you will, on materiality. Most of the debate wasn't phrased in terms of materiality, but I, I think this was a fact of a gloss on materiality. It's also, these proceedings have laid the framework that for many years the Commission's environmental disclosures would largely be premised on the idea of materiality rather than specific disclosures about environment. It's a, maybe just to observe as, as the end that it's kind of ironic that the commission spent 10 years resisting a petitioner that wanted it to have environmental disclosure rules that it didn't feel were necessary. But it's probably likely that in the coming year, we're going to see the reverse of that situation with the commission promulgating climate change disclosure rules and, and being quite probably sued on the theory that they go beyond the commission's responsibilities under the securities laws. So that, that's my short detour into the 1970s and some things that I think happened then that are relevant. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And I think in that, uh, it was really in the 70s and 80s that we saw the uh, culmination of, you know, years of sort of litigation addressing um, materiality or hinging on materiality determinations. And Joan, I don't know if you had any thoughts in terms of you know, what 
what the SEC was pursuing and what others per generally pursue in terms of private litigation around whether or not material information has been disclosed. So you might be on mute there. Trying to get off mute there. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you know, it is a consideration that the thing that's interesting to me, David, is something that you said at the beginning, which is often it's a hindsight analysis. The difficulty in enforcement, um, plaintiff's counsel, um, and frankly, defense counsel as well, are often well, always dealing with a situation that is known, right? The material information has become known. Uh, there's been a reaction to it. And so there's a lot of different ways to sort of think about materiality. The challenge, of course, is when you are considering materiality, when you're the company and you're doing uh, deciding whether you can do issue or repurchases or whether uh, in the disclosure context, whether something is going to be viewed as material. So it is very much of a hindsight analysis. I, I want to acknowledge that up front. And um, I should also say up front that the rulemaking, um, the case law, SAB 99, all of that is carefully analyzed by the enforcement division and I assume by plaintiff's counsel as well. I really can't speak to plaintiff's counsel as well as I can to the enforcement context, but it's a similar analysis. You, you always look at all of the, those things, but they are definitional. And what you really have to do is figure out how to apply those definitions to the facts of a particular matter. Uh, whether it's a merger or a corporate filing or any of those things, you have to figure out how to um, uh, apply those to those facts. Um, it is very much of a hindsight analysis. So you really have a sort of a leg up in terms of knowing um, what, what the end story was. One thing that I don't think people focus on, certainly from an enforcement context, and I assume from a plaintiff's counsel context as well, and a, a materiality decision is often made at a very early stage of the investigation. You don't want to investigate, you, and if you're plaintiff's counsel, you don't want to litigate if the matter isn't going to be viewed as material. And you often have a lot of the information that you would need. Maybe not all, but a lot of the information as to whether something is material is going to be known to you at that point in time, which is why it's a hindsight analysis, right? But I think that sometimes people think that enforcement maybe isn't listening regarding materiality or plaintiff's counsel. But I think in large part, it's not that they're not listening, it's that they already have made um, a lot of a decision regarding that. Certainly there's more to investigate, um, but the materiality decisions are often, uh, like I said, made, made at a very early stage. I also would highlight that certainly from an enforcement standpoint, you're working with um, the Office of General Counsel, where Rich was. You're working with the division of, uh, and, and Dan, of course, was the general counsel. But And also, um, you're working with the Division of Corporation Finance and the Office of Chief Accountant um, to determine whether something is material. So you're not doing it in a vacuum. There's also a lot of scrutiny um, by other divisions and the general counsel's office and the commissioners of any enforcement matter because they recognize that the commission, at least in part, speaks through enforcement matters that are brought. Um, and so a materiality decision um, and what is viewed as material, um, people look to enforcement matters to also seek guidance. Um, I mean, Rich was talking about litigated cases um, and certainly, of course, important rulemaking and, and SAB 99 and things such as that. But people um, often look to enforcement matters as well because it's a window into how the commission has applied the definitional standards of materiality. I, if I could say one more thing. Yeah, um, I, think that, I think that often um, people get confused on materiality because they're thinking in terms of what um, a, an investor might be curious or interested to know. But I think what we have to always remember is that's not the standard. It has to have significantly impacted the mix of information. And it's not just because as an investor, you would be interested to know or the reasonable investor might be interested to know or curious.
Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think and it's a great segue to just talking about the standard a little bit in that, you know, when you think about it, our modern concept of materiality really crystallized around the two sort of seminal Supreme Court cases in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and I, I think to some extent, it's surprising that these cases have really stood the test of time over the years and, and the law about what standard we apply in terms of materiality has just uh, remained surprisingly stable, particularly in light of recent uh, Supreme Court action. So, so it's a very um, well uh, established, time tested standard uh, in many respects, because it has come up in subsequent litigation after these Supreme Court cases over and over again. Uh, and, and the first case I'll mention, of course, is uh, TSC Industries, Inc. v. Northway, and that was decided in 1976. Um, the court was uh, addressing uh, alleged omissions and misstatements in a proxy statement in that context. Um, the reason it came to the Supreme Court there was because there had been a growing conflict in the circuits over you know, what was the standard for assessing materiality uh, against that backdrop that Dan described uh, uh, about, you know, what, what is information that investors uh, find important. And the court was um, notable, it, it was notable, I think, in that case, that in resolving that conflict, the court really recognized the need to weigh the shareholders need for information, important information, uh, versus some sort of overly broad standard that would then, uh, as the court said, result in an avalanche of trivial information. And um, in the case, the court rejected the uh, Seventh Circuit's decision that uh, material facts include all facts which a reasonable stockholder might consider important, to Joan's point. Um, that was not the standard from the uh, Supreme Court's perspective, and the court noted that if you had a standard that was unnecessarily low, uh, as the Seventh Circuit had articulated it, um, then management would be subject to just unreasonably uh, uh, significant liability um, for insignificant in, in omissions and misstatements, uh, and they would basically cause this avalanche of trivial information um, to try to avoid liability if that were in fact the standard that were applied. And so the court was unanimous in Northway and they held that information would be considered material only if there was a substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor would consider it important. And the court phrased it in another way as uh, being a substantial likelihood that the information would have significantly altered the total information, total mix of information available to investors. And so from Northway, we got the substantial likelihood test as well as the total mix test, where the total mix test was looking at what is the information that is available on this particular matter generally um, through the statements that have been made and otherwise. <clears throat> and the court noted, um, I think, importantly in Northway that it was, as I mentioned before, a mixed question of law and fact, and that normally it would be left to the jury or some other fact finder to ultimately determine. Uh, and also, I think, important from the case, um, we draw from the fact that they say it, it, there needs to be an objective standard for materiality. Um, you can't have a standard that relies on the subjective importance of the information to particular investors. Um, you had to go with the standard that looks at the objective importance of the information to a reasonable investor. Uh, and so for that reason, I think in the subsequent case law, you know, we're, ne we're never making this differentiation between uh, a mom and pop investor versus a highly sophisticated uh, investor or an ag algorithmic trading firm or something of that nature. Uh, I think it was also clarified in Northway um, that uh, uh, they said it is appropriate that these doubts be resolved in favor of those the statute was designed to protect. So 
I think uh, Northway favored the plaintiffs in this regard, encouraging the lower courts to not, you know, withdraw issues of materiality away from the jury and leaving it for the jury or fact finder to decide. Um, and even though Northway specifically came up in the context of the proxy rules, uh, it was then applied, you know, more broadly to the federal securities laws and in particular uh, Section 10B and Rule 10B-5. Um, and I would also note, <clears throat> too, that even though it was a proxy case, proxy rules case, uh, it really applies in context of any communication. So um, you would look at the materiality of information, whether it's a press release or a 10K or a proxy statement or the like. Uh, and then ultimately, in the commission's own rulemaking, uh, as we talked about before, they, there was actually the acknowledgement of that standard in the adoption in both Rule 405 of Regulation C and Rule 12B2 uh, under the Exchange Act, as well as Rule 1-02N uh, in Regulation SX of um, basically the uh, articulated Northway standard. It says material as used in the Commission's rules um, it relates to when there is a substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor would attach importance in determining whether to buy it or sell the securities registered. Then later uh, in um, 1988, uh, the topic came up in Basic Inc. v. Levinson about uh, that really sort of, I think, in many ways refined the Northway standard uh, to relate to situations where you have contingent future events that you're looking at and trying to assess the materiality in a much more uh, forward-looking context where you don't necessarily know um, exactly how everything is going to ultimately come out. Um, and this case dealt with famously dealt with the issue of at what point negotiations regarding a business combination uh, became material and would be required to be disclosed if the um, issuer had an affirmative disclosure obligation. And what the court was when rejected, what, what the court ultimately rejected in basic was that um, it, there had been a notion advanced that no such disclosure would be required until the parties had reached an agreement in principle. Um, and that sort of, that was one of those examples of a bright line that had been advanced uh, to simplify the materiality determination that the court squarely rejected. Um, and the, the court, again, echoed the Northway standard of materiality, uh, particularly in the context of Section 10B and, and Rule 10B-5, which was at issue in the basic case. Uh, and the court, um, you know, took note of uh, the prior decision that had been reached in the Second Circuit in uh, the famous um, case of uh, SEC v. v Texas, Texas Gulf Sulphur, um, <clears throat> which had articulated the general principle around contingent or speculative information or events uh, when assessing materiality. Texas Gulf Sulphur was decided back in uh, 1968, um, at where, you know, I think basically in the, within the context of 10B-51, um, the, the court looked at the, um, the Second Circuit had looked at the concept of how do you deal with a materiality framework around uh, contingent or speculative information or events um, and what was discussed was um, it will depend on, as the court said, in basic balancing both the indicated probability that the event will occur and the anticipated magnitude of the event in light of the totality of the company activity. Uh, and in the context of the uh, negotiations for the proposed business combination in basic, uh, the court said that materiality in that context depends on the probability that the transaction will be consummated uh, and the significance of the transaction to the issuer of the securities. Um, and that once again, we were reminded that it is a facts, uh, fact intensive inquiry uh, and on a case by case basis. 
Um, and I would say some takeaways from basic in terms of uh, that are relevant to our practice today beyond is that it really extends beyond the merger negotiations context, uh, really to other circumstances where you have uh, these uncertain uh, future events. Um, and, you know, by adopting that um, Texas Gulf Sulphur uh, concept, this probability magnitude um, notion is important for talking about issues that we face today, things like cybersecurity risks and uh, climate change. And like, in fact, the commission in their 2010 climate change release um, actually cited the basic and, 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 uh, and talked about it in the context of um, using that framework of probability magnitude in assessing materiality um, for, for the types of events that come up when you're talking about climate change. And I, I would just note that in, in corporate disclosure counseling that we all, that many of us do, the probability magnitude test is, is just ingrained. It's like really, it, it's as important as the word materiality um, because so often we're dealing with a um, uncertain item and you want to know, can the company still go to market? Can, you know, where are we in the, in the spectrum of probability and magnitude? Is it really, really big? If it's, if it's really, really big, it's harder to conclude that you, you can go ahead without disclosure. So it, it is a, um, it's one of the more practical tests that has come, that have come out of these cases is it's, it's sort of easier to understand what the point of that is and, and apply it. Um, and I don't think very many of us have trouble figuring out how to apply that to us. So it's, it's a good, it's it, in the scheme of the development of materiality um, standards. That's one of the uh, more useful ones, I think. Absolutely. Everybody always wants a bright line in this area. Um, <laughs> everyone wants a bright line, um, but it doesn't exist. But you're right, Meredith. And also from the enforcement standpoint, of course, it, afterwards, you're looking at how probability and magnitude uh, were often applied in these situations. Yeah, and just rounding out the, the case law, uh, one more recent case that's just worth noting to emphasize the point that was just made that um, <clears throat> bright lines are, are disfavored in this realm is the Matrix Initiatives Inc. v. Uh, Sir, uh, Syracusano case that was decided by the Supreme Court in 2011. Um, there, the Supreme Court, true to form, rejected yet another bright line test and went back and reaffirmed the concepts of materiality from Northway and Basic. Um, in the case, at issue in the case was whether reports of adverse health effects by um, users of pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical products could only be material if the number of people adversely affected reached some sort of sign, sign, statistically significant threshold. And the court rejected that concept saying the statistical significance approach was not the only reliable indication of causation in this concept, context. And if you actually applied this bright line statistical significance test, then you just artificially would exclude information that could otherwise be considered significant to the investment decision of a reasonable investor. Um, and, and the court with some variation just reiterated that in this case, you look back to that Northway standard, uh, is it substantially likely that a reasonable investor would have viewed the information as having significantly altered the total mix of information that was made available? Uh, and so, with that, we really, um, to this day, have the framework that we apply um, in all these uh, disclosure decisions. I think it probably makes sense to uh, now transition into perhaps one of the areas where uh, materiality is constantly coming up, and that is in the preparation and audit of financial statements, um, you know, which are often 
considered by many to be providing the most material information to the reasonable investor in terms of their um, investment decision in a company. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Trevor and Dan to, to get us tar- started, particularly on the topic I think that was very significant of uh, SAB 99 and how the commission staff articulated some concepts of materiality that are very important to us to this day. Maybe I can start here just saying a little about what SAB 99 is and where it came from and and then let Trevor talk about how it impacts auditors and financial statements. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, there was something about crisis in confidence in financial reporting and auditing it culminated with the Enron and WorldCom cases, and then uh, on the heels of those things, the enactment of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. But the, you know, the, the lead up to those events were, uh, I guess, an increasing series of, of restatements by public companies and other questions about auditor independence and reliability of, of financial statement reporting. And all this was kind of brought together in 1988 in a speech that then Chairman Arthur Levitt gave called The Numbers Game. And he, he talked in that speech about earnings management and the pressures that companies were under to meet analysts' earnings expectations because of the dramatic Im- impact on stock price of, of missing the market's expectations even by a, by a penny and how that led to earnings management by public companies and in turn pressure on auditors to go along with what might be sort of dubious or gimmicky accounting judgments. And one one aspect of the things that he pointed to in that speech was abuse of the concept of materiality and particularly the idea that a company could record an intentional error that was immaterial in amount um, because it would have just the impact needed on earnings per share in order to to meet the market's expectation. Um, He cited companies, uh, examples of of cases where companies have made intentional errors to to change quarterly EPS and taken the position and urged on their auditors the position that the, the, the error wasn't material because it was less than 5% of net income. One of the, he had in that speech a number of things that should be done in response to that. One of them was for the SEC staff to give guidance uh, about the concept of materiality and how it applied to financial statements. And about a year later, that did indeed happen when staff accounting bulletin number 99 was was issued in, uh, I think it was August of 1999. Just briefly, I, I would say that the gist of SAB 99 is that materiality for financial statement purposes is not solely a quantitative issue. And you can't take you know, a, a bright line approach saying that something that affects net income or a balance sheet item by less than 5% is therefore necessarily immaterial. You have to consider all of the facts and circumstances surrounding context. The, the SAB 99 lists a bunch of factors that should be considered. Um, there, there are things like whether a misstatement masks a change in, in earnings or, or affects earnings so that they meet analyst expectations, the point Levitt was discussing in his speech, in his speech um, whether a, an error or a misstatement changes uh, a loss to income or vice versa, whether it affects the profitability of a segment of the business that's important, whether it mass uh, compli- non-compliance with a regulatory requirement or with, with loan covenants, uh, whether it affects management's incentive compensation or not, that, that type of thing. Um, the Yes, I, I, I'll just say briefly that I, I think the reaction to SAB 99 w- was 
Well, at one level, it's sort of hard to disagree with what SAB 99 says, and the, uh, there obviously was a, a history of abuses leading up to it. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think for many people, it was regarded as greatly comp complicating the determination of materiality and making it very difficult, perhaps, to come to the conclusion that any error was immaterial, given the host of factors that SAB 99 uh, felt had to be considered in making a materiality determination with respect to financial statements. Um, yeah, maybe I'll stop there and, and ask Trevor to give his perspective on these developments. Yeah, th thank you, Dan. Um, appreciate that. Maybe just a couple of thoughts on materiality overall and, and just in the context of today's discussion. Um, as auditors, as we look at determining materiality, um, which is really a key professional judgment, we do look first to how do reasonable investors uh, look at entities to make financial decisions? We often look to analyst reports to identify those factors. And so, you know, that judgment uh, that, that we reach at the beginning of the audit and reassess throughout the audit is, is really of utmost importance. You know, today, as you mentioned, SAB 99 continues to be the framework that both auditors and registrants look to to evaluate the materiality of errors that are identified. Um, and as you indicated, there's a series of factors to, to look at there. Um, there really are two types of, of errors and two types of restatements uh, when we think about the impacts of the materiality of errors. Uh, the first being a material error, which would require the financial statements to be restated um, retrospectively. And that's often referred to as, as a big R. And then there's immaterial restatements, which are often referred to as little r's. And the immaterial restatements are, are often situations where the error may not be material to the prior year, but it could, it could be material uh, if it was corrected in the current year. So as registrants and auditors go through and consider the factors in, in SAB 99, the SEC is often observed that we need to ensure that the registrant is completing an objective analysis of all the qualitative factors, as Dan talked about. SAB 99 itself was intended to address situations where quantitatively small errors could be determined to be a material error and then require material restatement uh, based upon those qualitative factors. In practice, registrants and auditors look uh, to SAB 99 to assess both uh, immaterial and material restatements and errors. Um, and making that assessment, if an error uh, continues to, to increase uh, in its significance, uh, then there's a lot more analysis that's needed to be done as well around the qualitative factors to overcome the quantitative significance. Maybe the couple other things that I, I would comment on would also include the fact that the error evaluation does not stop at the financial statement impact. The registrants also are required to consider the impact on ICFR and thinking about what the potential magnitude of the error could be in assessing the impact on internal control and the severity of internal control. Uh, there are situations where an immaterial error could be indicative of a material weakness, even though it was uh, corrected through an immaterial restatement, where in most cases a material error is considered to be indicative of a material weakness. As I think about just restatements and the impact on restatements themselves, uh, think about restatement trends. You know, over time, we have continued to see the number of material restatements decline, uh, but the number of immaterial restatements as a percentage of total restatements has, has continued to increase. Some of that relates to increases in immaterial restatements for footnote disclosures, uh, and, and also the fact that, that immaterial restatements are often the result of companies' internal controls identifying errors in subsequent periods. Maybe the last thing I'd comment on, Dan, would be is the SEC's continued focus in this area around assessment of errors, disclosure of errors, uh, including the current year uh, SEC rule related to uh, clawback considerations uh, and the requirement for companies where there are corrections of prior year errors in a current year 10K to indicate that, that uh, on, the, on the 10K itself, uh, that those errors were corrected. The SEC staff in December indicated that they believe the indication of checking the box would be required for all restatements, whether that's material or immaterial, as well as voluntary restatements, 
Then there's a second requirement to consider the need to check the box to determine whether the error corrections also require recovery analysis of executive compensation. Maybe just a couple of our comments about restatements, which I take it that the SEC staff regards as, as a problem currently, or at least in, did in 2022 when the current chief accountant addressed it. Um, companies don't like to have a big R restatement if they can avoid it. You have to file an 8K. It tends to attract a lot of attention. It's likely to have an impact on the stock price. This has changed under the uh, SEC's clawback rules, but I think under pre-rule company policies, in many cases, a, a, a big R restatement, a reissuance restatement, would trigger a need to look into clawbacks, whereas a revision restatement uh, wouldn't. Again, that's not the case any longer. And over time, the percentage of restatements that are done by revision, that is just a change in a current filing rather than withdrawing the prior financial statements has, has grown. Paul Munter, chief accountant, gave a speech in 2022 in which he talked about this. And he kind of made the, I'd say the theme of that speech was SAB 22 doesn't work in reverse. That is, the qualitative factors in SAB 22 that can make a small error material don't mean it can't be used to make a large error immaterial, which at least in his view was something that many companies were doing in order to avoid having to do a, a reissuance uh, restatement. So I don't, I, I haven't seen restatement statistics since his speech to know to what extent that's changed practice, but he was clearly concerned that the concept of materiality was being, well, abused or at least bent in order to avoid making a reassuring truth statement. And in practice, um, um, we continue to, to see, you know, registrants as well as ourselves as auditors um, having, you know, continuous dialogues with, with the SEC staff around these topics. Um, and in, in all cases, um, it's, it's facts and circumstances. Um, but, but as the companies are assessing the impact, it, they're really looking at the balance. So everything you said is, is spot on, but they're really looking at the balance and what's the impact of all factors that they consider and what would impact the investor um, as far as whether they may or may not reach consensus earnings, what's the impact on other contractual arrangements. Um, but, but we do continue to see well-reasoned considerations by registrants, um, even for errors that, that maybe um, have some level of significance. I'm not gonna say that, it, that they are overly significant, but some level of significance, um, registrants still taking positions that, that we believe uh, are supportable, even if the error um, is, is, let's just say, a more than inconsequential. Now, that being said, um, that there is a, uh, there's a onus on both the registrants as well as the audit committee and then us as auditors to ensure that all of those factors are objectively considered and that there's not a bias by management in making their decisions around whether or not an error is or isn't material and in what form they may or may not uh, correct that error for. I, I don't know if, if you or Meredith want to, or others want to, Comment, but it does seem to me that the stakes have gotten a lot higher in these restatement decisions because of, well, at one level, the box you have to check, but then more importantly, the, that the clawback rules that are embodied in the listing standards now, so the decision to restate may well also be a decision to have to claw back compensation from management. I guess I, I think that the, um, while the stakes may be higher, people are still approaching it the same way. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, if you're going to end up with a little R anyway, um, you know, if you need to, if you need to revise the financials because you have a mistake, um, then, you know, whether or not it's a big R restatement, I don't really think is the, it, the way the rules landed is, is the, is the yeah. full answer. Um, on this point about the, you know, you don't get to use it in the opposite direction. The one thing I think it does support to some degree is is the um, addressing the law of small numbers 
point. Like you can end up with something that has a, a big impact because you were just barely at a, at a, at a loss or just barely at a um, profit. And so something has a bigger impact than it would if you didn't have that. And I think there's support based on a, a reasonable materiality judgment looking at, at and in, including SAB 99, sort of, it is anchored in materiality. Um, and so there, I find support in there for um, possibly concluding that something that might look bigger than it is doesn't require a statement. Um, so there, it, it's... It has, again, it's like the other point that we talked about a little earlier. It's very much ingrained in, in how we do our jobs now. You do a 799 analysis whenever you find a mistake in the financial statements. You likewise do a 799 analysis if you find a mistake in the disclosures. I mean, it has just really become ingrained in how we, it's a helpful tool to assessing materiality. I don't think it's as scary as it was when it came out. Um, it is interesting because you know a lot of times you'll have the accounting firms ask you know you have to you have to go through your sab 99 analysis with the accounting firm and then the sec staff will say you know give me your sab 99 analysis which of course is you know depending on how it's done you try to have it be privileged there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of side baggage around the sab 99 analysis but it's a very helpful tool to figuring out if you have a material issue i think and, and merit i would just echo that 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 we do see, and, and the same thing that you're seeing is, is that it is very common, and that is the framework that all registrants use for any type of error. And, and you're right, whether it's a, in the financial statements or the footnotes to the financial statements, there's still an obligation for the company to go through that analysis. And as I mentioned, to also go through the analysis of the impact on internal control and what right. severity could be of the control deficiency. It's at least a nice practical, like like the magnitude probability test. It's it's a it's a practical tool to help you do a materiality analysis since materiality is so amorphous. Um, there are very few practical tools to this, and I, and I find that to be seven ninety nine was actually at the end of the day quite helpful. Oh, it was enormously helpful, Dan. If I could just interject, I, I do think that the clawback. Um, analysis is being done by people um, when they, especially if they think they have a really big restatement um, or a problem. And um, I certainly have heard from more than one person that the clawback was a consideration, which I don't think it should not be a consideration at all in the decision. But I do think that has crept into the analysis and I'm concerned with the expansion of clawbacks. And one last point, I think, on the financial uh, statements is that <clears throat> an audit of financial statements is that we think of the SEC as, you know, having to deal with materiality, but in terms of standard setters, uh, both from the FASB perspective and from the PCOB perspective, a lot of the things that they do also um, build upon a framework around materiality. <laughs> Well, I think um, we'll now transition. We've talked a lot about the history of materiality and some of the key milestones and on the theory that we're making history today as we speak, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about really materiality in the spotlight today. And uh, you know, I think in many ways, the same questions keep arising uh, in the notion of uh, materiality and how it applies to the many types of disclosure issues that we face today in that the question arises as to who is the reasonable investor you know what what is the type of information that is in fact important to a reasonable investor in making a investment or voting decision uh, and you know does that a reasonable investor change over over time and, and the type of information that the reasonable investor may want uh, or, or finds important uh, changes over time. And I think it's interesting uh, as sort of a um, setup for this conversation in how uh, 
the commission over the years has pursued different approaches, particularly to disclosure requirements in terms of having very specific uh, prescriptive disclosure requirements versus disclosure requirements like management's discussion analysis that are much more focused on materiality and describing things from a materiality perspective as opposed to specifying in a line item the exact type of information that a company is supposed to disclose. And, and we actually saw the commission asking about this in, in the concept release on regulation SK changes that came out back in 2016. Um, where the commission said, you know, should we re revisit what is materiality and establish more specific standards? And should we have rules that are more prescriptive or more based on a company's own judgments about materiality? Um, and I think these same questions and debates continue today in some of the rulemakings and decisions that the commission is making. And maybe, Meredith, I could turn it over to you to talk about that dynamic. <laughs> Sure. Um, so this is it's this is extremely difficult to nail down right now. Um, it, it, it's also highly controversial. The well, and the topics include things like should should there be prescriptive rules around climate change? What about the new rules on on cyber and a, and a AK and for business studies? The, those sorts of things. And the 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 key thing from a rulemaking perspective, at least, is as you think about this, and if you're trying to decide if something is material and you're trying to assess what is being told to the SEC in connection with that, you're still looking at the same test and who is a reasonable investor? Um, and what? How do, how do you figure that out? Um, when I was, at the SEC in, in 2009, we had a rulemaking petition from investors with trillions and trillions of dollars invested in the markets wanting very specific climate disclosures. And the, you know, how do you decide that people with trillions and trillions of dollars invested who wanted very specific information weren't reasonable um, in wanting that information? And that kind of an analysis is, is um, constantly in front of the SEC. There's constantly people saying, I need this information, I need that information. And at the end of the day, um, you still have to go through the same analysis and you're not getting, and everybody thinks they're reasonable who wants various information. And, and so you, the, the short version is that you can't just assume because people are asking for it that that's what a reasonable investor wants. And you have to go through the analysis that you go through in doing a rulemaking of um, is this information, you know, you can do a concept release, you can do a rule proposal, but, but in these various areas, you know, they get the questions out there, is this something that a reasonable investor would consider important? And then you also have um, how expensive would it be to put together? Is the purported need for the information really just speculative? That's been a, a top a, a refrain um, in, in numerous rulemakings lately from those who vote against the proposals that the that the benefit to investors is is um, is purely speculative. No one really knows whether inf inf investors need that information. And it's also unclear how materiality actually fits in, in the rulemaking um, approach. You know, you have to, the, I think a good question here is how does materiality fit into the cost benefit analysis? Right, rules are not infrequently um, vacated because the courts don't agree with the cost benefit analysis that the SEC undertook. And you know, do you have to have materiality be part of that cost benefit analysis? I don't think it's written into the into the Ministry of Procedures Act and other things that way. But as you're trying to figure out what the benefits are, presumably you're trying to figure out if, if it's important information to a, to a reasonable investor. Um, and, and then is it worth what it would cost to put it together? 
does it drown out other information um, and and all those sorts of things and and so it's not it's changing in that what people think is important is becoming um, is, is changing with the times and um, I, I think people um, with regard to some of the proposed climate disclosures, for example, wouldn't disagree that information that the SEC would like to see in filings would be would be helpful to a reasonable investor. Can you rely just instead on on interpretive guidance that says you have to talk about information that's material in connection with other information provided, for example? Those are all things that that are being hotly debated now. And the moving from an overall materiality analysis to prescriptive rules, and then trying to figure out how that materiality analysis applies in the context of prescriptive rules is, um, is just dramatically changing the, the um, landscape for rulemaking right now. We're, we're gonna see it soon, I think, when the, when the human capital proposals come out it's obviously going to be a, a big topic when the climate rules get adopted, if they do. Um, and it, 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 it was obviously a problem on the company buyback disclosures. So each one of these points, there are, there are many, many people calling for the disclosure, um, but you can't, you can't assume that because people are calling for it, that the information is material. So I think it's, it's a, um, uh, it's a watch this space. The materiality standard has not changed. And it all seems to come down to is it is the is the information something a reasonable investor would want and ha has a reasonable investor changed um, such that this is the information they now need um, that they didn't need, you know, say 10 years ago. Yeah, I think that, uh, that's a great way of putting it. And I think the um, the current landscape highlights a lot of these issues that uh, that have persisted. Back to Dan's example of the NRDC case, um, uh, those many years ago. And one thing I would note too that is perhaps complicating the discussion to some extent is how the notion of materiality itself is. Uh, sort of applied in other contexts. And, and we see that certainly in the context of sustainability and climate disclosure right. in that other jurisdictions outside of the United States uh, have different standards and other standard setters, um, um, you know, non-government standard setters have adopted a notion of materiality that isn't necessarily pinned to a reasonable investor standard, but in some cases is pinned to a stakeholder standard or right. a broader concept of who should have this information and why and, and is it important to them right and i think there's there's sort of two points to make in connection with that one is the concept of materiality has gotten completely confusing um because you know for example people when they do the sustainability reports they have to list their material topics and then they you know if they're well counseled, they drop a footnote that says, but this isn't material under the US federal securities laws. This is material under whatever standard I'm reporting to in my sustainability report. Um, so there's the, and, and then who knows how that version of materiality is defined in that set of rules. And then, the, you know, for example, with the new reporting, the climate reporting in, in the EU, that they use, um, and general, the ESG type reporting in the EU, they, they use um, double materiality. So you could either have it be, you, know, you have to report if it's material in the traditional sense, kind of traditional sense. And then in addition, is it important to your employees? Is it important to the community? Is it important to your customers? You know, you pick your various topics and, and they use the word material. And so somebody will say, well, it's only required of material. And then you go look at it and it, so that is, that is really fuzzing up how people think about materiality and as standards are becoming more global, um, or, you know, companies are global and they have to report to all these different standards. It becomes extremely difficult. Um, I don't think there's anything that can be done about that. 
think it's it's unfortunate. You can't have like it would be better if they had a different word they used under different standards. Everybody likes our word. Um, <laughs> it doesn't work very well. Um, so there's that. And then um, I think the the um, I just I, I think that the the one thing that happens over and over again, it's kind of like the old 2020 hindsight thing, but it is it is being applied to non-traditional topics. So now you have topics that are of interest to a whole lot of different stakeholders and they get a lot of something happens at a company, they get a lot of publicity, stock price drops. And so suddenly things that are not traditional topics for um, investors are claimed to be material. And, and then you end up with, with 10 v 5 class actions and the like, and eventually court saying, well, no, that wasn't material. Um, so you, it has become a much muddier area. And, and, you know, you see a stock drop, is that because of that thing that happened? Or was it something else? Um, and that is leading people to push on the SEC and others to require disclosure on these topics. And my, my running joke is, is we're going to end up with all these very specific disclosures. You can never get rid of them once you have them, even if they seem no longer relevant. It's like the jeans that might fit again, we might need it. You know, um, I just, I, I think it's really, it's terribly frustrating to see these highly prescriptive standards put in place in reaction to specific issues that that are currently an issue, but really hard to really hard to ever walk back from. And they, I don't even think anything's especially tied to materiality as this happens. And so it is, it is definitely fuzzing up how you think about the SEC's regulatory landscape. I think one of the things, it's not quite explicit, but I think one of the things that the commission was trying to say in the seventies is that the reasonable investor is making an investment decision in order to earn a profit, in order to make money. And then, you know, reasonable people might make investment decisions on other bases. I, you know, you don't want to invest in a defense contractor or a tobacco company or something like that. But those, those kinds of non-economic considerations are outside the concept of materiality. But I'm not sure that that would be the general view when I think yeah, now, I think evolving, at least. yeah, I know. I agree. I agree, Dan. I think the hardest part now is that some of these things really do make a difference on whether you can make money. You know, if you look at the 2010 climate guidance, you know, if you're, if you become uninsurable because you're in a, in a flooded area that didn't used to be flooded, um, you wouldn't have built there if, if you, you know, knew what, climate change or whatever you want to call it. We didn't actually say that you had to agree there was climate change in that release. Um, but it, if it can impact how, if you're making money, those are reasonable things to, to ask about. Do you need a prescriptive rule? That's a different point, right? Yeah, I, mean, no, I, I certainly don't mean to suggest that this purely economic approach to materiality would preclude any climate change. Disclosures, right? No, it's the same thing on on human capital. All the disclosure about what you need to do to 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 have you know good engineers. Well, if you're a tech company, you need some good engineers. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you think it's appropriate to have to talk in detail about your diversity and inclusion efforts. But um, these are all really difficult issues that are changing the materiality analysis. It's still the same rules, but people are thinking about it sort of rapid fire differently than they were. And more of them are, you know, when in 2010, the trillions and trillions of dollars were all basically pension funds and, you know, a few very, very large investors um, who were particularly interested in climate matters. And now it's a lot, it's a bigger group. So maybe the reasonable investor has changed. I don't know. I think that's one of the biggest challenges in rule writing at the SEC and making recommendations to the commission for rule changes is uh, 
trying to figure out who this semester, reasonable investor is. I mean, the academics have spilled a lot of ink over the years debating, you know, how many reasonable investors could dance on the head of a pin. But I, I think it's a very tough thing because the commission, the, the reasonable investor isn't just those trillions of dollars in highly sophisticated um, uh, pension funds and things like that. And there's always the notion that despite the primacy of institutional investors, individual investors need access to basically the same information so that they can make their own individual investment decisions. And even though the markets have changed radically since the 60s or 70s in terms of how people do invest, there's always that underlying notion that I'm writing this for my mother or grandmother or, or father that's out there uh, investing their own money in a company as a way of securing their retirement. And, and I think that challenge of kind of bridging the gap between those extraordinarily different groups that all seem to come within the, uh, under the umbrella of a reasonable investor is, a, is continues to be a big challenge for the commission. I think the same thing happens from the enforcement perspective as well. Yes. Well, one of the problems in the enforcement perspective is people always focus on what I call the fraud du jour. Um, but the problem is that that's just the fraud du jour and there's going to be another high topic. And so that that is the thing. I will say from an enforcement, I know everybody's focused on rightfully so climate and those issues right now. But I wonder to what extent that's going to change. And personally, I think that cybersecurity is one that is bipartisan and enduring, but only time will tell. Definitely. Any uh, final thoughts from the panel before we run out of time uh, on this uh, very interesting topic? I know we've covered quite a lot of ground here in this uh, 90 minute program. Can we all agree that AI is per se material? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> if you search 10Ks this year, you're going to find AI in every one of them. Somebody's going to be. <laughs> and that's why, Meredith, it's constantly changing, right? AI wasn't. It always comes no, along. No, no. And I'm not saying it's per se material, I promise. I know that. You're not quite as that. Well, I'd like to thank David for, for putting this together. Um, materiality, I think, is an enormously uh, challenging topic, even though, as you said, David, it's been maybe defined at a certain fairly stably for a number of years. How to apply it, I think, is incredibly challenging. Yeah, and I, and I guess one of the things that I was hearing you know, the last few comments is, and even if you didn't call it materiality, even if we came up with different words, you'd still have the same issues. You'd just be talking about it with like two or three or four different terms instead of the one. But I mean, it's, it's a term that just has so much work to do and, uh, and it gives rise to all these questions. Uh, Absolutely. I, 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 I was hoping that sometime during this panel, I, I'd be able to quote from something that was said by somebody who isn't on the panel. In 1978, Roberta Carmel gave a speech on materiality. And what she said at the end of the speech is something that, that uh, I at least agree with, I think is still true today. She said, despite the legitimate concerns of ethical investors, I believe we should exercise caution in applying a non-economic standard of materiality to disclosure requirements, because some investors may want certain information in order to make an investment or voting decision does not mean that mandatory disclosure of such information would be necessary or appropriate in the public interest or for the protection of investors. That's terrific. Yeah, very well said by Roberta. <laughs> well, great, thank you all so much for your time. And I'm going to turn it back to Susan to close us out. Great. Thank you all for such a great panel. And it's apt that you end on comments from Roberta Carmel, who's been a longtime trustee and supporter of the society and a current trustee. Uh, so again, I'm Susan Markle, current SEC HS chairman. And on behalf of the SEC Historical Society, I would like to thank you for joining our program on the evolution of the materiality standard. And thank you again to our sponsor, Deloitte.
As mentioned at the start of the program, this program has been recorded and will be included in the Historical Society's Virtual Museum on Financial Regulation as part of the Gallery on Corporate Disclosure at our website, sechistorical.org. I invite you to, to visit the Virtual Museum and reminisce about things you remember and learn about things you didn't know. Also on the website, you can donate today to preserve SEC history for tomorrow. The SEC Historical Society is a nonprofit 501c3 entity, and it is only through donations that programs such as this are possible. Thank you, and I hope you found this program informational and enjoyable. I know I did, and I appreciate the comments from all of our experts on the panel.